Good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> that was a trick question. My name is Peter Henry. I'm Dean of the Stern School of Business, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening for an event that, for good reason, garnered over 1,400 RSVPs. I believe that is an all-time record number of RSVPs for an event here in Paulson Auditorium. It gives me great pleasure to introduce James Gorman. James Gorman is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Morgan Stanley, and he's here with us tonight to share his expertise and wisdom with us. And James, I'd like to extend my personal gratitude to you for being here, for making the time to come down to Stern this evening, and for the firm's continued support of the school and of our students. Thank you very much. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Morgan Stanley is one of our founding corporate partners with over 15 years of support, consistently a top recruiter of our students, and a firm that has built a visible presence on campus over the past decade. It's my belief that we have even greater opportunities before us to deepen our relationship and in ways that create mutual value, not just for us, but also for society. In our conversations, it's really clear to me that Morgan Stanley and Stern have a common vision for 21st century leadership. Just a little bit of background on James. He's been Chief Executive Officer and President of Morgan Stanley since January of 2010, and its Chairman since January of 2012. Before that, James served as the Co-President of Morgan Stanley and also served as, as its Co-Head of Strategic Planning. Over the years, he served in many distinguished roles at Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, and McKinsey. He shares his leadership outside of Morgan Stanley as well in his, in his capacity as a board member of the Institute of International Finance and as a member of the Financial Services Forum. He served as a director of Graham Wyndham, a New York City nonprofit child welfare agency, and formerly chaired its board, and he's a co-chair of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Business Committee. He's done many, many things outside of Morgan Stanley. Tonight's conversation is facilitated by our own Professor Charlie Murphy, who needs no introduction for the students here. But I will just say briefly, Charlie teaches undergraduates, MBAs, executive MBAs, faculty, and I've heard also the dean from time to time. <laughs> Charlie began his career as an electrical engineer at Sikorsky Aircraft. He started his financial service career at the First Boston Corporation as an equity security analyst, and eventually went, went on to become global head of investment banking, global head of equities, and a member of the executive board of Credit Suisse First Boston. He continues to provide senior advisory and consulting services to several financial service organizations. Thank you, Charlie, for moderating tonight's evening tonight's event, and for everything you do for Stern, we're delighted that you're here to lead this conversation tonight. Without further ado, turn it over to James Gorman and Charlie Murphy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> what we're going to do from a formatting standpoint is we'll chat for about 40 minutes, and then we'll turn it over to you. So if you can start thinking up your questions, we will uh, flip the floor over towards maybe 5.45 or 5.40. Let me start by saying I have, I have a large number of friends who work for James, some of whom used to be my partners. And he's been in charge since 2010. And the comment when I asked them about James, I know James, but when I asked them, is they said he's the real deal. I think what you're going to see over the next 60 minutes is what the definition of inst inspirational leadership is. And to give you a little helpful hint, a leader is someone you want to follow. A manager is somebody you do something for. With that, we'll start. James, you left Paradise, Australia, to come to the United States. What was that all about? <laughs> Are there any Australians here? <laughs> yes? They all, they all stayed. Morgan Stanley, one over here. Job? I offer jobs to all Australians I run into. <laughs> We're like up to 84% Australian now. <laughs> I tell you, just before we start, I have to say, for those of you who are watching that little preamble, having somebody take your photo in front of 500 people watching you, having your photo taken is a little awkward. So <laughs> nothing in life quite prepares you for that. Um, certainly not growing up in Australia. Um, I was uh, I'm one of 12 children. And uh, it got a little crowded at home, so I had to get out. <laughs> No, I was, I was working as a lawyer in Australia, and I wasn't very good at it. And my two elder sisters were lawyers. They're very good at it. And I just I wanted to be, I wanted to be in business. And, and the Australian system 
unfortunately, is very different from the US. You don't have a liberal arts mm -hmm. education. So you start off at 17, I think I was 17 and a half, or 18, and you basically pick your career at that point. And I don't know about all of you, but I was not quite ready to uh, pick where I'd spend the rest of my life and how I'd do it. So I, I, I strayed into law and eventually just said, listen, I, what I really want to do is uh, be in a world where I'm making decisions. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that was to get in the business. And back in 1985, the way to get in business was to go to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's really what happened. I, I'll tell you though, uh, do a few people have, here have uh, student loans? Put, put your hand up if you have a student loan. Put your hand up if your student loan interest rate is more than 15%. My interest rate was 24%. Jesus. Um, so, and when I borrowed, uh, the Australian dollar was 84 cents to the US dollar. And when I landed in New York, it was 58 cents. Mm -hmm. uh, so it got a little expensive. So the problem was I had to stay in the US to earn some US dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's if, a true story. If, if you, let, let me expand on that a little bit different direction. If, if you read James' bio in, at length, you'll see he was a law student and then an MBA. And then he went to some firm called McKenzie. And he was lucky enough to get on the Merrill Lynch account, which he was on for quite some time. And then they realized how smart and good he was, so they hired him at Merrill Lynch. And then eventually he went from Merrill Lynch, probably because of John Mack, I would suspect, preeminently, to go to Morgan Stanley, having developed a great expertise in private wealth management. Did you plan it that way? You know, Charlie, it, your, your careers don't come in a straight line with right. a little ribbon around them. Um, no, what I planned to do was to, uh, I actually thought I'd do, which it sounds very immodest, so I admit to that up front, uh, was to be a judge. Mm -hmm. That's what I kind of, I kind of like the idea of sitting up there and saying, you know, <laughs> dictating the answers. <laughs> and uh, my sister actually became a judge down in Australia. But no, I think you, you know, you, f you follow an interest, and if your interest is compatible with your skills, mm -hmm. things just grow from that. Mm -hmm. um, in truth, I've been approached by Morgan Stanley uh, three times in a 12-month period. And the first time uh, I was, you know, things were going very well at, at Merrill Lynch, and I was not interested in moving. The second time, things were not going so well for me at Merrill Lynch, and I talked to the people at Morgan Stanley and felt they're even more confused about what they're trying to do. And the third time was when John Mack was brought in and he mm -hmm. called me, I think, the next day and said, would you come back and talk to us again? And I was fortunate enough to, uh, to accept. So, you know, it's, it's just chance. You could have, you know, it, it doesn't come in a, a neat bucket. A lot of kids ask me, you know, how do we get to sort of do what you did? Yeah. And the, the answer is, you know, find something you're interested in and give it your best mm -hmm. and see where life takes you. But be open-minded and don't always look for you know, the gold-plated, perfect mm -hmm. uh, position. Do something that is more what you're interested in rather than what everybody else thinks you should be interested in. Mm -hmm. Kids today seem to be in an incredible rush. You must see that or notice that a lot in terms of being well, I have the two, CEO of two an investment kids. bank. I well, that, kids, so that helps too. About this age. Well, not everybody's age here, with no disrespect <laughs> to, yeah. a, to a few of you gray hairs out there. Um, no, they, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of pressure on kids now to sort of become what they're going to be. Right. And, and it's, it's very hard to do that when you're 19, when you're 25, when you're 29. You just, Don't you, know. you evolve. Right. You, know, you, you, you know, look what you're doing now right. compared to what you were doing 10 years ago and 30 years ago. And, and the same with me. It's just, you, and I, tr I just try and encourage them to accept that, that life, life is a journey. And if you rush the journey, you know, A, you're not going to have as much fun, but B, you may end up in a place your destination really weren't, wasn't intended. Absolutely. How much risk do you take in the journey? Oh, I, 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 th I have two <coughs> basic principles which I apply to business, and I think I've mm -hmm. applied it to my career. Mm -hmm. um, one is understand catastrophic risk, what could really derail you and take that off the table. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, again, because we're speaking about me, so this is kind of fun, you know, <laughs> so I can keep talking about myself for a little but bit. We'll get here. off you in a minute. We have a couple more questions. Good. Um, but the, uh, 
so the catastrophic risk was coming to the US, borrowing at the time, which I did uh, $32,000 at 24% interest and not being able to pay it back. Right. And I thought, well, the downside is, worst case is I go back to Australia. I've been a lawyer for four years. I go back to the law firm. And you know maybe it takes five years, 10 years to pay it off. But mm -hmm. what, what a great experience I will have had right. having done that. Sure. So that's the catastrophic. If you can solve for the catastrophic risk, then, and we'll talk about it later in terms of the business, then I think, you, then I think almost anything else is, is uh, up, for, you know, up for go. Okay. And the, if you find something that you're good at and you know you're good at, yep. rather than what other people tell you you're good at, but you actually know you're better than most people at this thing, then you get very aggressive with that. Mm -hmm. And I think having that self-confidence about the things, not that your resume says you're good at, not that your friends think you're good at, but what you actually know you're good mm -hmm. at, and being very aggressive around that is sort of the opposite of the catastrophic right. risk thing. And that's how, that's how I've tried to manage risk with career and more importantly with the business. Mm -hmm. what, one more personal question and then we'll get to the business. And this personal question is extraordinarily important and I get asked it all the time because we're in, we're in the same club except I'm married a lot longer than you are. How do you do what you do and stay happily married and have a life? <laughs> There's a couple of assumptions in there. Uh, <laughs> um, I do have a life. <laughs> no, we, we were actually celebrated our 25th uh, wedding anniversary uh, last year. And, and, and like your career, it's a journey. Right. And it doesn't come in a straight line with a little ribbon wrapped around it. At least mine hasn't. And you've got to work at it. Um, but it's, it's all, all part of the process of, you know, finding balance and being able to say no. I, I got, you know, I get asked to do something. Um, I'm looking at Joe and Saba who work with me. Um, we get asked to do events every night. Right. And... They're all, any of them on their own is interesting. Mm -hmm. But another event to do some nights a week is to go to the gym. Another event is to sit down at dinner at 7 o'clock, 7.15 with my wife, which is what I'm doing tonight. Mm -hmm. um, another event is to drive to Providence, Rhode Island to see my daughter who's up at Brown on Saturday night mm -hmm. for dinner. And they're, they're all, you know, you've got to think about all of these things are part of your life. And if you only let the work stuff become the most important event, then the other stuff just falls apart and everything takes work. A marriage takes work, you're sp you know, spending time with your kids and bonding with them and guiding them takes work. And, um, but the one thing that I've given up on and I, I, maybe we talked about this in my office, but you, know, you think about um, your marriage, your job, mm -hmm. children, your broader family, your health, and your friends. Mm -hmm. The thing I gave up on was friends. And occasionally I call one of my friends and say, will you have me back when this is all over? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because you can't, you can't have it all. And at different phases in our life, we give up on some of those things. We hope it's not health. Right. But for some of us, at some point, it becomes health. Some of it's our relationship with our children, our relationship with our spouse, obviously our careers. And if you accept that you can't have it all, Whoever you are and whatever age you're at, then it's okay. It's when you can't accept that is when people go into overdrive and then right. they really get out of balance. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, do I wish I could spend more time with my friends? I've, I've played poker with a friend group for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we used to play, you know, every month. Now we play every two years. Yeah. yeah you make trade-offs. They'll come back. Don't worry. Let's get to the industry. You were recently in the FT with a great interview. And we talked about this in your office. And when asked to describe the industry, you said it was a very sexy industry. Yeah, a lot of feedback on that, too. Yeah, I bet you did. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us what that means. Well, firstly, it's, you know, everything is context. The journalist, um, uh, Tom Braithwaite at the FT, he said to me, um, you know, that everybody wants to work in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. That's sexy. Banking's not sexy. Right. And I said, no, it's a sexy industry. And that, so anyway, that's the be careful of job in, of uh, interviews with journalists. But I really believe that um, 
whether sexy is the right word, maybe, you know, if I'd been more thoughtful, it's dynamic, yeah. it's energizing, it's innovative, um, it's fast moving, you know, you're in the markets, the, mar the markets every day, it's like, you know, it's like Forrest Gump and his box of chocolates, you don't know what you're going to get, right? Right. You wake up, what happened to China? I look at, first thing I look at every morning, first email I look at is what happened to the markets overnight? And then if there's a problem, I call somebody mm -hmm. and try and understand it. So first you've got the markets, which are this, this animal that's you know, right. writhing back between fear and greed and bulls and bears, and that's going on in the background. Then you've got really smart people working really hard and trying to get stuff done for others, right. you know, for our client, we're a client business. So everything we do, all the electricity is paid for by our clients. So that combination of a very um, uh, uncontrollable sort of external world that you're, uh, the world you're operating in the markets combined with really dynamic people, combined with trying to help clients do some very interesting things. I, I find it sexy, maybe that's the wrong word, but certainly dynamic and certainly energizing. And, you know, I, I had, um, I just called a CEO of a company uh, before I came down here that's a, um, let's say a $50 billion plus company. Mm -hmm. So a significant institution and talked about what was going on in that institution. And there's some, you know, some real activist activity. And we, you know, we went back and forth about it, and we had our own experience at Morgan Center with some of that. And in 10 minutes, we covered an enormous amount of ground. Mm -hmm. and, and this individual, that, you know, they thought it was very helpful. Hopefully it was. But you, you, know, you then get off the phone. And then I, I met you know, um, uh, yesterday the gentleman from Turkey who's um, uh, you know, one of the most innovative entrepreneurs in the history of Turkey, a fascinating guy. I had a, a meeting with um, the Chinese finance minister on Monday morning in our office, mm -hmm. uh, Lo Ji Wei. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're constantly um, in the flow of things that are going on in the world that matter. Because I really believe the banking system, financial system matters. The, econ the economies don't just grow by themselves, they need to be financed. You need to match issuers and investors. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. R regulation, we talk a lot about it in my class, certainly, and, and in many classes at the school, has got a very heavy hand now redesigning your business. You're a former McKenzie guy, so this is the stuff of, on which you were originally fed. How do you find working with them? Does the law degree help? One of your compatriots, Jamie Diamond, is, is quite astutely complaining about them on occasion, but very diplomatically in his shareholder letter. But they ain't going to go away, and there's a lot of them, and there'll probably be more in the future. How do you see that affecting your business as time goes on? Well, I, I actually spent, uh, uh, where are we, first, I was Tuesday, I was in Washington with mm -hmm. all our key regulators, Dan yeah. Trillo at the Federal Reserve, head of banking supervision, uh, Marty Gruenberg, the chairman of the FDIC, and uh, uh, Tom Curry at the OCC. You know, it. I think I'm a realist. You deal with the world as it is, not the way you want it to be. Right. The world as it is at the moment is the banking industry damn near created the global economy. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll talk about who and why and how much responsibility the actual banks and their management had in that, but, but they became the vehicle because of the leverage that they had and the lack of liquidity when it mattered. You cannot expect to operate in the ecosystem, which is the global economy and society, and get away with that. Right. That's not going to happen. Because the cost of people who lost their jobs and lost their houses and suffered real financial and other stress is real. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a repercussion from that. And the regulators reflect legislation, in this case Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank reflects the political will. And the political will reflects the popular voice. Right. And the popular voice was, change something so this doesn't happen again. Right. So change. So as a realist, I say, fine. That's the rules of the game. Our job is not to take a sort of uh, a, a moral philosophical view on this. Our job is to generate a return for people who give us their money, called shareholders. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, they take their money and they go away. They're like the kid who picks up his bat and ball and just goes home. So if you just say regulators are wrong, that doesn't help the shareholder. Right. So you need to adjust to that regulatory reality. Um, you know, more narrowly, being a lawyer is maybe marginally on the help, uh, you know, helpful. Um, but honestly, we have fantastic lawyers, many of whom 
graduated uh, from NYU Law School, and you know they, they, they carry the water there. I think the, the biggest skill in dealing with the regulators is to really try and um, see the world through their lens. Right. And I, I give I give you an example of something I do, which I don't I don't know whether other CEOs do it or don't do it. Every night, every time um, there's going to be a material news story about Morgan Stanley that I'm aware of that's come in. Usually, we know about it the night before in the paper that I think is really meaningful. That if I were a regulator and I read it and I I'd say, well, that's not good. Right. I call them up. So I call the head of the SEC, the head of the FDIC, the head of the OCC, the head of the New York Fed, the head of the Washington Fed, and uh, the head of the Bank of England or the PRA, and sometimes mm -hmm. the JFSA in Japan. Every single one of them. Every time there's a story. Five minutes, pick up the phone and say, you are going to read this. Obviously, your team will tell you what it means. Let me tell you what it means from our perspective. Five minutes, hang the phone up and move on. And every single time at the end of the call, they say, we really appreciate yep. it. Because they're confronting that news in the morning. And we're a regulated institution. We're one of the five or six largest institutions in the country. They want to go to bed that night knowing Morgan Stanley's going to be OK. Absolutely. So it's, it's moving yourself into their head, which doesn't mean capitulating to every right. request they ask, but understanding where they're coming from. Second area, which is one of my favorites. Your business is being dramatically restructured and changed through technology, probably at the fastest rate of change that we've seen in the world today. It's having a major effect on the way you structure your trading floors. It's all new types of products being developed, some of which are called robo this or robo that. The question for me to you as the CEO is how do you stay current with the technology so that you can make effective decisions. I know you're going to tell me you rely on people, but how do you personally stay up to speed because it's coming at you so fast and in so many different forms? Well, there's, there's, there's a, a necessity and there's a danger. The necessity is you need to understand the language, the acronyms. Mm -hmm. You need to understand what your various teams are doing, both in managing your infrastructure sensibly, but also in how they're using technology to prosecute their business opportunities. And you need to be able to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. um, the danger is you think you've got the answers. Right. So how do you stop from being the person asking the questions to being the person then demanding a certain type of answer? It's, it's ironic you've asked. The, uh, my son tells me I use the word ironic or irony too often, so I probably just misused it. But um, it's a coincidence yeah. you just asked this there question. You go. Because we just had a meeting with about 20 folks uh, for an hour and a half today on um, the changing face of technology for the individual investor. And, sure. And, you know, it was fascinating. By the way, there, there was a, a couple of interesting statistics, came, facts came out of that. 8% of our clients would rather deal direct only which basically means they're looking for an opportunity to fire us. Right. This is on the wealth management side. So 8% mm -hmm. are sitting there saying, I really don't like what I'm getting from these right. guys. I don't want a financial advisor. I want to figure out a way to do robo-advice and self-direct and phone or internet. So, so is, that, is that a fee-based decision? No. Or is it a service decision? I think it's behavioral. Okay. It's preference. Um, but interestingly, for direct only, this isn't your question, I'll come back to it, but for direct only clients, um, only 24% of people who are using direct now only want to use direct. Really? So I said, far from this being a terrifying outcome, right. this is actually an opportunity. So how do we create a value-added advice model mm -hmm. for people who already have a direct channel? Sure. And at the same time, how do we defend our channel? My point is, I could ask the business questions around the technology. Do I understand the code that they're writing? Do I understand how you build a user interface that has the most uh, you know, uh, user-friendly application for the clients. Um, no, I don't understand, and I'm never going to understand right. that. So, but we spend four billion dollars a year on uh, technology expense. Uh, it's you know the whole uh, securities business on the institutional side. Large parts of it are going electronic, which is taking out the mm -hmm. intermediary, the role of the you know traditional salesperson. Um, and obviously, on the retail side, it's 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 a function of everything that is changing in the way people deal with their financial institution. Right. 
So again, the, the challenge I think as an executive is to not try and be the expert because you'll never catch up and you shouldn't, but to know enough to ask the right questions mm -hmm. and to know enough when somebody's screwing up or somebody's doing a good job. From your perspective right now, if, if we were, and it's almost the end of the year, and I know having been there, you have all of your meetings thinking about budgets and- Bonuses. We're, <coughs> we're in academia, I can't mention that in front of the dean. He, anyway, <laughs> he gets very upset with bonuses from the standpoint of investment bankers. As, as you look at the business going forward, one of my favorite discussion topics, and the dean is very into this also, is who, who's going to pay for all the infrastructure that has to be built and rebuilt in the world? You've always had a preeminent project financing group. And in the light of what's changed now with the regulation and shrinking the balance sheet, where's the money going to come from? And, and do you guys think about that a lot? Well, we do, you, you don't have to take the money on your own balance sheet. In other words, you, you don't have to use your own capital mm -hmm. and borrow against your own capital. And, and in fact, Volcker has effectively so precluded that. Right. I think the limit is 3% of your own capital right. can be used for proprietary. Um, but for example, Charlie, we've, we launched an infrastructure fund to do exactly this mm -hmm. about three or four years ago. And we raised $4 billion in the first fund. Mm -hmm. 400 million of that was our money, right. 3.6 billion others. We're in the process of raising a second fund that I think will be somewhere north of four billion, four mm -hmm. to five billion. Right. Um, so there's eight billion dollars of investment money that's arrived. You know, the government is looking at, um, you know, building a new uh, tunnel into New York City, which would be, you know, even larger than the Second Avenue, you know, subway system or the Big Dig in Boston or whatever. Probably the biggest infrastructure development project the U.S. has seen for a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're looking at a combination of public and private financing sure. and the, the, the government financing coming from the city, the states, Jersey and, and New York and, and the federal government. Um, so I think more public-private partnerships, more long-term infrastructure uh, financing provided by sovereign wealth funds, pensions, endowments that want that part of their portfolio right, built longer out. duration projects. They become right. too, mm -hmm. too dependent in many ways on the private equity space. Um, so I, I think there's, there's gobs of money out there. And as the world is moving more to defined contribution plans and superannuation type plans, mm -hmm. through the retail institu institutionalization of that money, uh, they will also participate mm -hmm. in it. So we don't have, we can be the conduit, the matcher. Again, our job is, you know, simply put, Morgan Stanley's job is to uh, manage the origination, right. management, um, distribution, of capital right. around the world. Right. And we do it for governments, we do it for institutions, and we do it for individuals. We're the ultimate matchmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and that's a much healthier position to be in than to be the person providing the capital. Because your shareholders don't come to you as an agency organization and say, we want you to take prop risk. If they want prop risk, they should go and work right. with a prop firm. Of course. So that's, that's the, I don't think the opportunity is diminished by the banks not being able to uh, lever themselves. Excellent, good. Next one. And then we'll get to Morgan Stanley. I have visions of you waking up in the middle of the night screaming shadow banks. I hate them. Are they as much of a competitor as we all think they are? Or, or are they another competitor that you enjoy in the market that you're in and can live with them? I would disappoint you here, but my dreams are a little more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, shadow banks? No. <laughs> that, that didn't make it to the top 4,322. Um, one day, maybe. Uh, listen, it's evolution. You know, the, uh, uh, as I, I said in our recent new recruiting video, um, you know, the, the banking system has been evolving for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, starting off as a bartering program, the, the word bank came from bench. It's, you know, from the, the uh, money lenders in Venice were on one side of the canal and the people who ran these great expeditions going and collecting goods around the world and distributing them were on the other side right. of the canal. The problem is their long-term infrastructure right. and, and project finance Right. deals where you're going out and raising money to send a ship off for six months and hope it comes back 
you need a person who's going to match that. And they went, and because they couldn't go to each other's side, they would meet on the bench over the top of those canals in Venice. And the bench, uh, the word for bench was Banco, I think. And that's where the banking system, where it came from. Mm -hmm. And you take it all the way through to, you know, new innovations. Some of them are very short lived and sort of get priced out of the market. Some of them, um, you know, are durable. The cash management account developed by Charlie Merrill. Yeah. You know, it was a great innovation. The, the, you know, it's John Reed at Citigroup used to say, and I think, no, I think it was Volcker who said the only good thing to come out of the banking system innovative wise was the ATM machine. Mm -hmm. And well, thank God it did. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and you look at some of the things going on now, Bitcoin, um, you know, personally, I haven't quite understood the need for another form of stored value. Um, but there are exchanges going up and, you know, I'm a bit of a, a Luddite. Right. I guess in this, mm -hmm. this regard, I haven't seen it. The advent of the, of the credit cards. Um, so I don't see shadow banking as in any way um, damaging or hostile to what we do. Mm -hmm. It's a big world out there. What you've got to do is take, not look at the world and say, there's an opportunity out there. Why aren't we doing that opportunity? But look at what your capabilities are. I, I give you an example, I, I used to call it the standard chartered problem. Mm -hmm. And most of you may know standard chartered bank is a large um, bank based in the UK, which is uh, very strong in very many emerging markets. Right. And particularly in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, North Africa and the Middle East. And pretty much every board of a major bank in the world over the last 15 years would ask the management, I think, certainly ours did, why aren't you doing what Standard Chartered is yeah. doing? They're growing in Malaysia and the Philippines and Indonesia and Egypt and um, Nigeria and you go all over the world. Why aren't you in these fast growing markets? Right. And our directors asked me that question. I said, because 25 years ago, we did not invest in the licenses. We didn't invest in owning seats on the exchanges. Yeah. We didn't build local management. We haven't developed the credit expertise. So it's a great space. It's just not our space. Right. What we're good at, though, is originating, managing, trading, distributing capital. Right. And what Standard Chartered's trying to do, actually, is do more of that. Right. My guess is they will do about as well at that as we're going to do at what their core skill is. Right. So being true to what your intrinsic skills are as an institution, which is part of your DNA and your history, and being honest to them, is one of the most important things you can do as management. The pressure we're all under when things are stable is everybody says to you, well, what's sort of your next trick? You know, it's like, well, what about just making money? Mm -hmm. You know, don't change your strategy yeah. every five years. Right. So that's, that's my, um, you know, we've got, you've got to be focused on what is good for you, not focused on what is making money for somebody else. If I asked you a general question that was something to the effect of, use the word focus. What, what are you and your board focusing on as you look out over the next five years, or is that too long? Um, well, I'll tell you a, a couple of tools that I use, and I share these with the board. Mm -hmm. um, one is, and we have an annual board offsite reviewing our strategy. Sure. But that strategy reflects our aspirations for the next three to five years. Right. That's about as far out as we look, apart from talent, which we look at 5, 10, and 15 years. Mm -hmm. Strategy, about three to five years. Um, each January, in the first week, usually on the first day, I sit down and write on a sheet of paper my personal 10 priorities for the institution each year. Mm -hmm. Because I think that institutions like ours are going to do a lot of things whether you're in the job or not. By the way, when I say that to my wife, she says, so why are you in the job? <laughs> <laughs> but they've got a momentum of their own, yeah, right? They just, right? They're just going to do stuff. So your question as a leader is to say, where are the areas that I can focus that would make a difference to the slope of the gradient to move it three degrees? So in 10 years, that three degrees is really big. Mm -hmm. And the third sort of sheet of paper, so one sheet is the articulation of our strategy, mm -hmm. which we set every May. One sheet is the 10 things... I personally think I need to get done for the organization that year. Right. And the third sheet is the numbers on our business from around the world that day, mm -hmm. which I write down every day. Right. 
And it's that toggling between a very uh, visceral, tactile feel for the daily numbers with a mind every year of, okay, unless we put some energy behind this, we're not going to get it done mm -hmm. each year. So keep the organization focused on that. Within the broader architecture of strategically, let's not get off the rails. Mm -hmm. And that movement between one day, one year, and three to five years is how I think about managing the organization. Mm -hmm. And I share that with the board, and you know, I think we're all completely, completely aligned by it. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be, and as a former consultant, it's easy to be all about the long-term strategy sure. stuff. And you don't want to be all about what happened last night in, in the Hong Kong markets. But you've got to be able to do both. Right. Back to you for a second, but it ties into Morgan Stanley. In 2010, you took over. John Mack picked you. You had fierce competition, actually from several of my close friends. And, and this is a true story. When I asked one of them what happened to you, he said they, they picked the right guy. And I said, why are you saying that to me? And he said, because we just had a financial crisis and the firm has to change. And this guy hasn't got the typical mind of a trading floor investment banker. He thinks more broadly. I said one comment, which I'll ask you. I said, he's an outsider as a 30-year investment banker. And they said, that's actually going to help a lot. How hard was it being the guy from the outside asked to fix it? Um, honestly, I thought it was a privilege. You know, I think to be given an opportunity to lead, and particularly a uh, a great organization during a time of stress is a real honor. It's a real privilege. And I, I took it as that, that um, I was certainly going to give it my all. But I, I never, and, and I completely understood why folks internally, from whom some are sitting in this room, sure. uh, would have legitimately said, are you kidding me? The guy was at McKinsey. We right. just had one of those guys right. here. <clears throat> um, he knows nothing about the trading businesses. He's never been a banker. He wouldn't know an M&A transaction if hit him in the head. Yep. Uh, you know, there, there are pretty legitimate questions. Right. I was asking them, yeah. you know. But it, it takes, you know, not to quote one of our political candidates, but it takes a village. Um, and you need, you know, the key is pulling together the right team for the challenge. And knowing what you know and being very directive about the stuff you need to be and getting the heck out of the road for the stuff that you don't need to be. But implicit in that, you used the word directive. I might have said the word direct. You have to make some incredibly difficult decisions in terms of moving people out of the way. Sure. Because you had monstrous cultural problems, I would presume, in terms of what you had to fix, especially with respect to compensation. To give you the compliment, you were, you were heroic and incredibly brave, basically, to tell the sales force, back off. When we make money, you get paid. And they, and they stayed. Well, some people thought it was incredibly stupid, but um, I, I, you know, I think you've got to, again, it, it goes back, Charlie, to seeing the world as it is, not right. the way you want it to be. We, we had a lot of folks who understandably wanted the world to be what it was sure. pre-crisis. Wasn't going to happen. Right. So you could either come to that realization on day one, or honestly, as some institutions around the world are doing right now. And you have to decide how soon you want to rip the Band-Aid off and just deal with reality. And the promise that we made to our organization was, if you, if you hang in there and weather this storm with us and put aside a little bit, was my comp up or down 10% or 20% this year, mm -hmm. and focus on your long-term career and the colleagues that you have and the job you're doing and the, the, the great joy and pleasure you get from doing that, this will work out. Right. And it will be a great ride. Right. But you've got to hang in there with us. If you're going to bitch and moan from the first five minutes, leave. Right. It doesn't matter. We'll be just fine. Right. But you want to be part of the boat rowing with us? That's great. And that was the message. And it was blunt, but it was, it was deliberately blunt because I felt we didn't have the luxury to mess around. The difference, having been there, where, where he lives now, where most of the people in his position make the mistake is they cave and take out the wallet and start writing the guarantees, which is a, a formula for disaster from my standpoint. They don't have the courage to stand up. 
James, uh, James didn't do that. How good and how, I can't say how good, how, how important is your board, especially in this day and age of this activist trend? Are you preparing them? Do you pay more attention to what's going on? We, we, you mentioned quickly that you had an activist experience. Maybe you want to just elaborate on that a little bit and then talk about what's going on with this activist thing. Yeah, we, we had somebody who bought into our stock when it was trading, uh, uh, it was trading at about $14, no, maybe 16 I think. I'm trying to remember back, I think it was 16 By the way, i tell you a funny story. I got the job, it was uh, in the high 20s. It fell to 20 in a couple of years later because of the whole peripheral crisis in Europe. So e every year I fancy myself as having one good investment idea. So I come home one night and my wife's in the kitchen and my son is there who's now 21. And I said, I've got my idea for this year. Just one idea. Because I figure if you can only have one idea, sure. you got a decent shot of it being a good idea. And I said, my idea is Morgan Stanley. <laughs> and my wife looked at me, she said, what do you mean Morgan Stanley? I said, we buy Morgan Stanley. And she said, you can't buy Morgan Stanley. You own all this Morgan Stanley, it's disappearing. Who knows what'll happen? And, and anyway, um, I said, fine, I'll take my 401k pl plan and my IRA, which I've built up over 20 years, and I'll liquidate those and put Morgan Stanley in it. Right. This is my long-term retirement. It's right. the best retirement decision I could make. And then the stock kept going down. Went from 20 down to 11. And every night I'd come home, how's that IRA doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I had confidence. This guy bought into the stock at 16. You know, we called him up. We called him up that day and I said, congratulations, you're obviously a smart guy because we're cheap. He said, you give us right now, had him on the speakerphone with our head of investor relations. I said, you give us your three best ideas yeah. for what you do if you're running this place. Right. And if they're a good idea and we can do it and we haven't thought of it, we'll do it. Right. If they're a good idea and there's a reason you aren't aware of why we can't do it, I'll tell you and we won't do it. If they're a bad idea from our perspective, I'll tell you that too. Right. Go. I love it. And his first idea was um, you should exit fixed income. And I said, it's an interesting idea. People talk about that a lot. I said, let me tell you why it's a bad idea. You can fire people. You can rent out their computers. You could convert our trading floor into a basketball court. Right, it's pretty big. Make a good one. But what do you do with the assets that you have on your balance sheet? Right. The only way you can fire the assets is to give them to somebody else at a discount to their current value. By definition, if you've got them at that value and they're not buying them now, the only way they buy them is if you discount it. So, you know, with hundreds of billions of dollars of assets at a discount, you wipe out what was then about $50 billion of capital overnight. I said, by, by fulfilling your strategic objective, we would wipe out our capital and not exist in your shares. You just bought it $16 or worth nothing. Right. What's your second best idea? Mm -hmm. And we went through that discussion. He sold the stock at 24, it's now trading in the 30s, and I called him up when he sold at 24. I said, you're not as smart as I thought you were. <laughs> but the board is very, um, the board has been just fantastic. We, we have a, and we try and think about the board because this is very complex, any of these financial institutions. Almost nobody could go onto that board and know everything. Right. Maybe some people have done jobs like mine would be the best shot, but beyond that, it'd be very, very difficult. But, and you don't want only accountants, and you don't want only professors, and you don't want only former CEOs, and you don't want only former bankers or traders. So we think of the board as a tapestry. Sure. And we're trying to build a tapestry where if you've got 10% of this, you know, this person's leg, and this person's left eye, and this person's right arm, you put them all together, you've got the perfect director. And then if they move together, that all works. It's when they're out of sync with each right. other, it doesn't. And happily, our board, it's led by Erskine Bowles, um, who's a, a wonderful man, and happily the board has, has moved in sync together. They've, during the crisis, we were having daily board meetings, every single day, and they were coming together, and it was incredibly stressful, and their personal reputations were online, and, mm -hmm. and in many cases, the stock that they'd, they'd earned on the board for being on for 10 years was on the line, and they, they, didn't, they didn't wilt at all. They were terrific. But we're, you know, we're lucky. We've, we've carefully constructed a board that we think has both the skills but also the social skills. Yeah, which is very, very important. I have at least three dozen questions left, but that would be unfair to you. 
we'll let James obviously pick as the hands go up. It's your turn. This gentleman here. Hello. Hi, Mr. Gorman. Um, my name is Chakshu Madok, um, and I'm a junior at NYU Stern studying finance and management. I just had a question uh, along the tangent of following your judgment. Uh, considering that you have to take a lot of decisions from time to time, I wanted to know how do you follow your judgment as opposed to these people giving you advice on, uh, inform advice on what to do from a day-to-day -day basis? What do you, how do you balance it out? Well, you, you um, <coughs> On difficult decisions, what I try and do is go to very different people, sometimes in very different parts of the organization, and posit scenarios or hypotheticals. And it's, it's a bit like a puzzle. You don't necessarily give them all the facts, so they don't know what you're trying to get at. But you're giving them elements of it to try and understand how they think about the problem. So one, to test how you're thinking about the problem and two, to figure out if there's something that you're missing, a factor that should be taken into account. So, you know, one is just making sure you've thought about it properly. And then secondly, listening to how they process the same set of facts and arrive at their opinions. And you've got to put your filter on, this person's coming with a political agenda, this one's coming with a little bit of an experience, this one's coming, you know, from, because they're, they're new to the industry, they're a little naive. You've got, you know, you put your filters on, but you sort of grab all of that information together and distill it in your head, start forming a point of view. But once you've made a decision, then move very, very fast. Don't sit on the decision. Once you've done it, you go immediately. And it's that, you know, it's a, it's a process. For the big ones, you never do it on your own. You don't, you, but, but you never tell people, very rarely you tell them what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. It's a little sneaky, but <laughs> it works. It works. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Lawrence Summers, ex-Treasury Secretary, was out with an um, editorial this morning right. saying that um, government bond yields are sending a powerful message to policymakers across the world, specifically um, that growth and inflation are subpar. Of course, this is happening when monetary policy has been asked to do the heavy lifting mm -hmm. for quite some time, particularly since the financial crisis. Um, <clears throat> he believes that um, fiscal policy needs to sort of stand up and do its part. My question is, um, what are your thoughts on that? And what do you think about the fact that there is some perception that monetary policy may be, the impact and effect of this may be waning? We're finishing at 7.40 or 8.40? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as, as long as we have um, a House of Representatives and a Senate and a President that are from different political parties, unfortunately, I think our ability to make real fiscal change in this country is very limited. Right. And you know, personally, I thought some of the recommendations coming out reference Erskine Bowles before, but Erskine Bowles and uh, yeah. Senator Simpson mm -hmm. made sense. It was bipartisan. I think 14 of the 17 people on the committee voted for it, and it got nowhere. So we're in such a dysfunctional uh, fiscal situation. That's uh, Larry Summers is obviously a very talented guy, very bright guy. And in theory, he's right. But again, back to deal with the world as it is. The world is, as it is, that ain't going to happen. Right. You're not going to get, you know, I was with uh, uh, Paul Ryan the other day um, with a group of CEOs in Washington. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, I think he's an unusually thoughtful policy person who is actually prepared to put down uh, real concrete ideas about the entitlements program, at what age you would change the vesting schedule, how you'd change it, things that he would do at a practical level that most politicians just aren't prepared to commit themselves to. And uh, so I think the opportunity for a real fiscal movement in this country when we've got positive economic growth and unemployment at 5%, it's going to go, ah, I'm not feeling enough pain for the electorate right now. It's five, you know, I'll tell you something, in 2009, <coughs> the average number of applicants for a job in this country, I'm told, 
uh, by Secretary of Labor, who was with us also the other day, Perez, <laughs> was over <coughs> seven to one. Seven job seekers for each job. Currently, it's about 1.3 to one. Mm. This country is almost at full employment. So the, with that will come economic growth. With that will come government surpluses. surpluses. With that will come some uh, uh, mitigation of the fiscal issues. So I think that there's ju it's just not going to happen. On monetary policy, I mean, I think the Fed, um, uh, I, you know, just on rates, I think the Fed has kept rates too low for too long. Yeah. And it's taken away a weapon. They now don't have that weapon. You can't use rates as a stimulus. I think, you know, the Fed should have moved last March. And I pray that they really do move this year. There is no economic scenario that has growth at 2 to 3 percent, unemployment at 5 percent, uh, consumer balance sheet stronger, corporate balance sheet stronger, bank balance sheet stronger, um, the mortgage market having, housing market having recovered, and interest rates are, if you had to fill in the box, what number would you put in? It ain't zero. There's right. not a person in this exactly world right. who writes zero. Thank you. My name is Dorothy Hill, MBA class of 95. I'm also a fellow uh, McKinsey alum. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I have a question for you regarding various epidemics that face our country and our world. One, for example, is domestic violence. As most of you know, October is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. The economic impact in the United States alone is over $6 billion. Oh. In Australia, the most recent estimate was $8.1 billion Australian dollars. Uh, what has Morgan Stanley done and what does Morgan Stanley plan to do to help not just the employees impacted by this epidemic, but our country? And then on a higher level, uh, with the growth of the economy uh, and, and jobs uh, being filled more quickly, we also have an economic impact of the increase in human sex and drugs trafficking. Uh, child porn alone is a $95 billion industry globally. There's so much that the banks can do. What can Morgan Stanley do as a leader in the global economic arena to combat not just domestic violence, but to help eradicate human sex and drugs trafficking? Thank you. Sure. Um uh, directly, I think very limited, to be honest. I know that's by the question presumably not the answer you want and certainly uh, not an outcome uh, that I would want. But you, you have to recognize what an organization's purpose is. Um, you know, our organization's purpose is, as, as I said, to match the capital flows and the various issuers and investors around the world. Our organization's purpose is not to opine on Planned Parenthood. It's not to opine on you know, uh, uh, global warming, it's not to opine on domestic violence, it's not to opine on sex trafficking, all of these things which as individuals we care deeply about. As individuals, hopefully we're supporting organizations that are trying to do something about that. So as individuals, we drive our activities into trying to make the world a better place. But as an institution, I think it's very difficult to pick a wide galaxy of activities that have, frankly, nothing directly to do with the institution, obviously indirectly, enormously, but directly to do with the institution and favor one over the other because where, where do you choose and how do you choose? That said, we have something called our foundation where we have um, uh, devote many millions of dollars every year to various activities and it covers some of the things that you've mentioned in much smaller numbers than you probably want. But the two major things that we focus on in our foundation is child health and child education. And we built the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital at Columbia Presbyterian. We've got a hospital in London at Greater St. Norman. We've got a hospital in Beijing, all designed around child. So we start with child health and child education. Try and solve the problems of the world at the youngest point of entry, and then work back from that. Finally, uh, we run something every June called uh, Global Volunteer Month, where all of our employees volunteer for a wide range uh, of causes. And you know, they include some of the things that, that you've mentioned that are very dear to their heart, and we sponsor a match uh, through our charitable matching programs. But institutionally, I think institutions have to be careful not to buy into areas where their owners have not asked them to do that. That's not their choice. It's an institution. And that's, you know, that's the way we do it. Yes. Okay. 
sorry. Good afternoon, Liliana, class of 2000. In, oh my God, I forgot. 2011. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have a question because it's something that's coming up in my job now and I just wondered mm. how would you approach this. Um, how do you manage expectations of executives? I think <laughs> kind of something you mentioned earlier resonated with me when you said they ask for what's the new trick and that whole kind of idea that we need to grow and that we need to have something new and that we have to kind of with the technology pressuring us that we need to be better and faster and and at the same time, all these macro projects have timelines that require more time to be executed appropriately. So how do you balance execution and expectations for faster results? Thank you. Um, exactly the same way as I do it for myself. If I ask somebody um, who's talking about a, a long-term expectation of things that they want to get done, I say, fine, how do we do yesterday? What are you doing to develop your talent? What kind of feedback discussions have you had with your people? So bring it down to a very short term. I'm prepared to listen to long term objectives. And as you as an employee, if you're working for somebody who is on you and you want to talk to them about long term things and they only want to talk about short term, you ought to be able to transition between both. Say, I've got some long term ideas I'm trying to help you with, but short term, these are the specific things I'm getting done. Or alternatively, if they're saying to you, long term, how are you going to change this business? What are you going to be doing to it? Say, here are some ideas for you, but in the meantime, here is how we're going to be afford we're going to afford to be able to do that because we're ringing the bell right now with our results. So again, it's in, in business, you have to figure out a way to toggle between the immediate, the medium term, and the long term. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. My name is John Aaron Lynch. I'm a physician in the executive program uh, in Charlie's class, actually. A um, little older than the average student here. Uh, I was wondering your take and on how you realized who your mentors were going to be through your career. Uh, this is something that I see in, in my own practice. You know, people sort of, oh, this guy looks like me. He acts like me. I'll just follow him. Did you have a more thoughtful approach, or was it just accidental? You know, it's a bit like the way we put together a board. I try and look at uh, what a lot of people do and pick the good bits and leave the bad bits behind. Um, so I'm not looking for somebody to be my mentor. I think that's a very, um, uh, it's a very artificial thing to create and it's gonna happen by happenstance because a personal relationship, the nature of working together, going through some stressful times together, building a trust-based relationship together. Those things you can't plan for. They either happen or they don't happen. In the meantime, look at the people around you and try and figure out among all those who could be role models, which part of their working life and the way they approach things is a role model for you and which parts you don't like. Um, in every new job I've had, I've gone out and interviewed effectively four or five people doing that job. So when I, I first left McKinsey, I joined Merrill Lynch as head of marketing. I knew nothing about marketing. So I went out and I asked Aldo Papone, who was the guy who created the, the membership campaign at American Express. He's a brilliant, he was a genius. If he'd sit with me for an hour and talk. I went to Shelley Lazarus, who was the CEO of Ogilvy, and asked her the same thing. So I went around four or five people like that, and everybody likes to talk, so that was easy. When I became CEO, I, I went to see Jamie Dimon, who'd been doing this for, for a long time. Uh, I went to see Richard Davis at US Bank Corp who doing Ken Chenault at American Express. Mm -hmm. And I sat with Ken and I said, you know, how do you do this? How do you manage a board? How do you manage your time? And everybody, and I've done the same now reciprocating for newer CEOs or younger CEOs uh, in my turn. And I think that the, it's to learn from others without trying to be another. Yeah, That's very important. One more because we have classes starting at six. Maybe the lady in the middle here. Pressure's on. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for coming, Mr. Gorman. Hi, Professor Murphy. How are you? I'm um, good. Um, my question is, so I know these days a lot of people are leaving financial services to pursue tech startups and their own startups or work for another startup or go on to the buy side. How does Morgan Stanley make an effort to retain talent? Because these days the turnover rate has, gone, has gotten so high. And now a lot of um, great talent is going off to create their own business. So how do, what does Morgan Stanley do to encourage people to stick around? Mm 
Well, the, the start with, are we attracting enough good people? And, you know, the answer is uh, from institutions like this and others around the world, we're attracting a tremendous number of good people. And, you know, in our analyst program, I might be off a bit on the numbers, but we made something like 80% of the folks who work for us a job offer, and over 85% of those have accepted the offers. So we get tremendous acceptance. That's the good news. The challenge is, as you say, um, in the face of the normal trials and tribulations of work, plus the externalities of, oh my God, this technology sector is so exciting, or yeah. I want to build my own app or whatever. How do you make people understand that um, there are very exciting careers in finance, in banking, and particularly at Morgan Stanley? And that's through the work experience itself. You're doing interesting work that's suited to what your skill set is. For people who aren't, I encourage them to leave. I don't try and you know, just use moral suasion to hold on to somebody. If they're doing things that is ill-suited to their skill set, they should go and do something else. But secondly, a lot of it is around the people. You know, at the, at the end of the day, um, my son is a 21-year-old at another institution, and, I, and he's going through all of the recruiting stuff now. And one of the first things he's talked about to me about is, I want to be around a group of people that I feel good about. Right. And I think we all do. We're, we, you know, we're, all, we're all naturally, maybe not all of us, but most of us are belongers. We want to be part of a crowd. And that's why we get, a lot of us get so much pleasure out of team sports or why we work so much more productively in team study groups and why we prefer having classes with 20 people and not with you know, one. Um, it's, it's a natural bonding experience. And at Morgan Stanley, I think I'm proud to say, we, I believe we attract really good people. I think there's a sort of goodness, uh, you know, without being too, um, uh, you know, romantic about it. There's a quality to the kind of people that we attract and they enjoy working themselves. You match that with substantive work, you don't have a problem with attrition. By the way, our attrition in the last couple of years has been radically different from what it was immediate post-financial crisis. So it's not, it's not a big worry. Last thing I'll leave you with is an example of We've got a board meeting coming up in a couple of weeks, and I asked um, uh, to have five associates talk to the board right. about what it's like to work at Morgan Stanley. Fantastic. And I'm going to meet them for the first time a couple of days before the meeting, just so I'm not embarrassed and walk in and don't know who they are. <laughs> um, but I, my message, I told the head of HR today, he said, well, what do you want them to talk about? And they're a little nervous. And what they, I said, they should talk about whatever they want to talk about. It's their forum to talk to the board. They want to talk about lifestyle and some of the issues that obviously have been very public and very sad. Talk about those. Right. They want to talk about the joy of work or the drudgery of work. Talk about that. I'm not going to direct them at all. And that's part of a culture where you trust each other. We're all trying to improve and sometimes constructive criticism is very positive. Please join me in thanking James for all Thanks, Thanks. Thanks Well done. Well done. Thank you.